And we are live. Hello, Hello to the one and only Betsy Bird. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. I um Good. well, you know, other than we have a war going on here in Israel and Right. I have heard about that. It's not good. But uh, for the pe- for the next for the past for the next forty five minutes or so, we are going to be in a wonderful world of uh, picture books and children's literature. And um, I can't think of anyone else better to do that with than with you. So um, I'm just going to introduce the program. Um, uh, I'm Mel Rosenberg. I am the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network, and I have the wonderful children's author. A blogger, a um, selector, um, Maven, Betsy, Bird. Woo! So happy to I have I like you. Maven. Maven's a good one. Well done. Maven is from, it's from Hebrew. Yeah. Ah, did, you know, did you know that? I did not know that. No. No. Okay. And so is Elizabeth, by the way. I knew that. That I knew. Yeah. Ah. Okay. One out of two. So so for yeah. people who, who know you, they're going to say... Why is she on Mel's show? She has her own show. She's had 300 podcasts. She just published 9,000. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating. What does she need Mel for? Um, so I'm just lucky. Having said that, for people who don't know how illustrious, how wonderful you are, a few words about you. Oh, by me? About me? Yeah. All right. Okay, here's the here's the quick and dirty. Uh, yes, I'm Betsy Bird. I am a children's librarian. Uh, started out my career at New York Public Library and became the youth materials specialist where I bought all the kids' books for Manhattan, Staten Island, and the Bronx. That was fun. I've published, oh gosh, three picture books, uh, one book for adult, no, two books for adults about kids' books. Uh, I edited a middle grade novel. Uh, no, I ed- ed- edited a middle grade book uh, that was a bunch of funny stories by women. And then I wrote a novel uh, for kids as well. I've got a podcast with my sister called Fuse 8 and Kate, where we discuss picture books and if they're class deserve to be called classics or not. Uh, I review for Kirkus and I blog with School Library Journal. Yes, and um, you've forgotten one thing, but oh. um, you uh, you've had just your your three hundredth blog. We with my three hundredth podcast episode. Podcast. Uh, that's yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I did. We just uh, we had our special I, guest John. I, I get the words mixed up. They sound so that's okay. similar. They did. And um and you are my 150th guest. Oh, well, there we go. Isn't that perfectly timed? So I'm like halfway, halfway to Betsy Bird. Um, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, but I started after you did. Um, so um you, you forgot to mention that you also have this 31 titles of 31 places of 31 books of 31 wonderful everything. Right. So every December I, I might have got the name wrong. A little a tiny bit off. Tiny t- Tiny, tiny bit. Uh, every December, I do the 31 days of 31 lists of the best books of that year. So I might do a list of funny picture books. I might do a list of gross children's books. I might do one of the best graphic novels. Um, and I do one every day for every single day in December. Uh, and people love it. And I love it. Because I get to honor all these books that, you know, we just had our, our ALA Youth Media Award announcements. And a lot of books did not get mentioned so at least they they can be on a list somewhere and um so you what what you do which is uh, so and oh i'm getting ahead of myself and behind myself at the same time (laughs) one of your wonderful books the um great the santa stakeout the santa stakeout Mm -hmm. one of your wonderful picture books and you have another one coming out this year um Mm -hmm. without going into too much detail because we're going to have another interview uh tell us about the one that's coming out I have a book coming out later this year. It'll be called Pop Goes the Nursery Rhyme. It's with Andrea Sarumi, and it is the weasel from Pop Goes the Weasel inserting itself into other nursery rhymes, much to the chagrin of the narrator. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a troublesome little weasel. It's a troublesome little weasel. Yeah. It's so cute. Weasels are so cute. uh, Oh, can can I tell people that I've had a sneak peek at it? You have. You've, You've one of the very few. And it's lovely. Thank so uh, I will be honored if you come back on when the book launches. I'd be happy to come uh, back on. Towards the end of the year. And maybe by that time, I'll have caught up to you with the uh, with the uh, <laughs> podcast. Sure. If you do one a day, I think that would totally work out. Yeah. 
<laughs> not not going to happen. Not going to okay. happen. Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, but the reason, the main reason that we're here is to talk about what makes a really good picture book. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anybody to talk to about this better than you. By the way, in your 31 list of 31 books for 31 occasions, what's your favorite list? Ooh. Hmm. I guess it would have to be the picture book list. The final, these are my favorite picture books of the year list. Um, that's the one I'm kind of aiming towards the entire time. I think it's my final list because it's the one that I just, I build up towards the entire month. And uh, yeah, it's just the picture books. I love them. What's not to love? What's not to love? But but, but here's, the, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you what the thing is. Um, okay. Some people think that picture books are not what they used to was. Yeah, those people, people who don't read picture books. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> some people yeah. think that picture books today are too commercial, that they're too mm -hmm. towards a market, that we've forgotten uh, the beauty of a picture book that tells an amazing story. Um, you're welcome to dispel all these things. Before you do, before oh, you do. easily. Uh, the, the ALA just announced the uh, Caldecotts and the uh, Newberries. A few words. Oh, uh, well done. Um, you know, usually... You know, there's uh, last year I was I was very disappointed with with some of the winners this year. I have at least one book where I was like book. But beyond that, uh, I've loved their choices. I particularly the Newberry. I thought the Newberry just knocked it out of the park, just did a great job. Uh, but I really liked the Caldecott winner. I really liked I love that is, this, my this, Mex this is, Mexican. This is, a this is the time to mention the books. Not everybody. Yes. OK, so. So I love the the Eyes and the Impossible by Dave Eggers got the Newberry. That is mwah, far and away a fantastically written book. I love that Big by Vashti Harrison got the Caldecott. Again, mwah, beautiful. I love that Mexican, one of my favorite books of the entire year, was mentioned in award after award after award after award. That was that was wonderful. If you haven't seen Mexican by Pedro Martin, uh, you got to. It is my favorite book of the year um, in many ways. And yeah, I was just I was just floored you know there was a party for langston by uh jason reynolds and the pumphreys that got a caldecott honor which i was so happy to see i had been rooting for that book a long time um so yeah it was a it was a great day wonderful so people come to you they come to you for kirkus reviews and they read your and they listen to your podcast and they they study all of the books that you deem to be the best books of the year mm -hmm. uh and what makes a best book of the year for Betsy Bird. So it has to be a mix of uh, kid friendly. A kid would actually enjoy reading this book, and what we say is, you know, we call them distinguished. But it's got to be, it's got to be good enough for the adult not to cringe. You know, kids like junk, just like adults like junk. We all like junk. Junk's fun. Um, there's good junk and there's bad junk. <laughs> And you have to, as a children's librarian, you have to sort of sort through. And there are so many picture books out now, more than there have ever been published before, just reams of them. And so I can understand why you'd find people saying, oh, picture books aren't what they used to be. Yeah, if you walk into a Barnes & Noble and look at the picture books, no, they're not because those are terrible books. I'm sorry, Barnes & Noble has terrible taste in picture books. But if you go to a library or an independent bookstore, Store and you look at the picture books, you will find some amazing, crazy good titles, but you have to sift through the junk. There's so much junk. Okay, so I, I don't want to piss off Barnes and Noble, uh, uh, but oh, um, go ahead. Okay, but you said something really important now, you see, because the, the, a lot of, a lot, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to be wrong. Um, a lot of the major publishers, I wouldn't say they didn't, don't give a hoot about the librarians and libraries, um, of course, they want the good reviews, mm -hmm. but libraries are not their biggest customers. Used to be, but are no longer. Correct. Yeah. So, Back in the day, we were we yeah. had a lot of power because we were the major buying power. And then the big box uh, bookstores came up and uh, we lost all that. So, yeah. So, so, so if there is such a thing as a declining um, intrinsic value of picture books over the market it could be like what mtv did to popular songs i think it's more a case of there's just more of them 
So we had actually the number of better books has increased significantly. I would go so far as to say we are in a golden age of picture books right now. All right. I'm going to put my put my image premature on that. But um, because there are so many more books coming out, you have to sift through to find the gold. There's more gold, but there's more stuff to sift through. So finding the books. So how do you find the books? You find librarians, you find booksellers, you find teachers sometimes who uh, who know the books, who pay attention to the books and can pluck out the really good ones for you. And that's how you find them. But if you're just looking at what is being published, yeah, you would look at it and be like, ah, these are all terrible. And it's like, no, they're not. <laughs> We're seeing more books uh, in America anyway. We're seeing more books from other countries being translated, which in the past we hardly saw at all. Keep We're your seeing... fingers crossed for me. Hey, I will. Very much so. We're seeing more books from a much broader range of voices than we ever had in the past. I mean, it was just, you look at even 25 years ago, what was being published, and it's just White City. And uh, so we're seeing like, you know, like much more diverse voices being lifted up. Um, and we're seeing some authors and illustrators that are pushing the boundaries of uh, of what you would consider like a picture book to even be at times uh people being playful with picture books you know the way that it works with the big publishers is they put out a lot of the schlock to make the money but then they have their good authors for you know their quality so they kind of use the money to pay the good authors and the good illustrators to get the good stuff out so you know it's kind of a balancing act so, so when you make your your picks and uh, you pick your books for the lists and and um and for your um um I want to get it right. Your podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, are you? Is like there's a financial incentive? Uh, is anybody paying you to choose one book or another book? No, that would be weird. Yeah, that would be that would be very sketchy. Um, no, but no, no. it's important. It's important to say this because some yeah, people take that's money and then they say that's your true. book is a wonderful I, book. There are a lot of big publishers. If I blogged for a publisher, let's say my blog was on the Scholastic site or something. Then every time I mentioned a Scholastic book, every person looking at me like, mm -hmm. yeah, but she likes that one. Uh, no. So I'm on it. School Library Journal, which is a review magazine that I also blog for. And because of that, I can see everything. Um, and, you know, but you're, it's tricky. You're, you're like, you're, you're like a, a priest of the industry. And I love uh, that. Huh. You call it the way it is. Sure. I try. But You're everyone not... has their personal prejudices. So, you know, you have to fight against those. But well, yeah. So, so then we're talking about the other side of religion, which is the, the prejudices. Right. Exactly. Um, picture books are in the mind of the beholder, whoever that is. Um, keep keep going. So the books have mm -hmm. to be um, a good junk, not bad junk. Right. Do you want to give me an example of a good junk book? Oh, sure. Um, it's not a picture book, but Good Junk is definitely the Dogman series by Dave Pilkey. Uh, you know, very popular with the kids. You can't get enough of them. And the parents look at them like, there's a fart jokes. I don't even, this is just junk. If you read every Dogman, you'll be shocked to discover how good they are. The writing is amazing. The emotional journeys of the characters. The hero of Dogman is not Dogman. It's Petey the Cat, the villain who is going through this entire like emotional, you know, metamorphosis in the course of the series. But it's Dogman. You would think it would just be some silly little thing. But Dogman is a perfect example of excellent junk. Just ma. And I think Dave Pilkey would agree. Um, so yeah, you can always find really good stuff in the stuff that doesn't look very smart to begin with, but is in fact quite intelligent. And, uh, okay, we're, we're yeah. not going to talk about the bad junk here. Okay, we'll talk about we the good want... stuff. Yeah. Well, there's, no, there's so, tons so, of good so, stuff. So, uh, keep, keep going. So, okay. so um, more and more that we can discuss. Sure. So uh, like a good picture book, generally speaking, um, you know, you want, you want it to do something. You could take the same theme you've seen a hundred times. First day of school, right? Oh, I always have a favorite first day of school book every year that just knocks it out of, and just, you know, does a great job because it's a very common theme. So um, there's different kinds, you know, school's first day of school by Adam Rex did it's from the school's point of view. And then, you know, we don't eat our classmates, which these, is about a little, are, these are my, these are everybody's two favorites. I was going to say mine, but 
sure. We don't eat our classmates about a little T-Rex who goes to school and then eats her classmates on the first day. How awkward. Um, so the th you know. 300 tuna fish sandwiches. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and has the most evil goldfish in any children's picture book of all time. That thing is dead inside. Um, I didn't like that goldfish. I love that goldfish. It is my, my nightmare. I had it my as my profile pick for a while there, just because there's there's nothing going on behind those eyes. Um, so Beatrice Alemania did... Uh, uh, one with a little bat uh, whose name escapes me right now, but it was her first day of school. So every year we get, you know, that's the thing. You can take a very classic theme, you know, riding the school bus, you know, first day of school. And if you are a great author il or illustrator. or right, Riding the school um, bus would be, uh, I will be fierce. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, there's a new one coming out from Lauren Long called The Yellow Bus. And that's coming. And that's great. Um, so again, you can do so many different things with like a common theme it'd be like well we've seen this book before but if the writing and the art is there doesn't matter it's suddenly brand new and of course everything's new to a kid um so any you know a, a small child if you give them a book on the first day of school whatever book you hand them they're going to be like oh okay this is the only book on this topic that has ever existed because it's the only one i've ever seen and so th that's why it's so important to get uh, well, what I've heard Walter de la Mer called the rarest kind of best is only good enough for our children. Uh, you know, you got to give them the best of the best stuff. And so and there's ways to do that. There's so much good stuff out there and weird stuff. I like a good weird picture book for kids, you know, one that goes in a direction that you didn't expect. There's a there's a new picture book called Pretty Ugly by David Sedaris with art by Ian Falconer. It is the most twisted thing you have ever seen. And I love it. And kids are going to love it. It is gross. <laughs> and I, it, it's great. So yeah, it just, uh, but it go, it just depends from book to book. A person could make a brilliant picture book one day and then the next day, bleh, it's no good at all. And you're like, what happened? It, you don't know. It's, it's sort of a, it's sort of an aligning of different forces. Things have to all fall in place in the exact right way. And that'll make the best possible picture book. Exactly. So I'm going to agree with you here. What has to fall in place? Well, let's see. There's a bunch of things. So you've got to have the author writing, you know, just at the top of their game, the best possible book. You've got to have the illustrator who is sometimes the author. And there's a lot of debate as to whether or not they should be the same person or not. What do you um, think? You got to have the illustrator. Uh, it's tricky. When we look at like the top, you know, the classics of children's books here in America anyway, you know, we look at uh, the Very Hungry Caterpillar, uh, Where the Wild Things Are. You know, these are all by the same person, the author, illustrator. I'm old, so I'm going to pick Madeline. Madeline. Perfect example. Uh, Elo no, not Eloise. Eloise was different. But yeah, in each of these cases, it was the the same one person. But then you've got Eloise. You've got uh, Goodnight Moon. You've got cases where it's like two people working together. Um, and so when the when it's right, now you need the good editor on top of that. The editor is going to have to be the person who, first of all, decides how much communication is going to happen between the author and the illustrator. Sometimes they're kept completely separate. They never speak at any point. That's going to make a difference with the final book to a certain extent. I, I would say that after interviewing 150 authors and illustrators, in most cases, unless the authors are very forceful or famous, uh, they, they don't have a real say in the illustration process. No, no. And that I understand why the last thing an illustrator need is for like an author to be over their shoulder being like, I didn't picture her teeth like that. You know, it's just, oh, it would drive you nuts if you were an artist. So I get it. But there has to be a happy medium. Some they have to be on the same page. So when I did my Betsy, book, if, um, there, if there isn't a happy medium, mm -hmm. if there isn't a happy medium, then you get this case where and this happens a lot where you're like, well, the writing was great. And the art clearly, like the maybe the words will say something, but that won't appear in the art. That happens a lot. And that drives kids crazy. And it drives me crazy. They'll be like, well, it said that she picked up a cupcake and walked out, but there's no cupcakes here. And I'll be like, yep, the illustrator <laughs> didn't think that was important enough. And, uh, or the editor, the art director might've missed it. The editor might've missed it. So there's all these different people who are working yeah, together. I, 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 I got in your way. We were going to talk about one of your books with the with the illustrator. Oh, right. Well, I so I did a book. Um, it was actually not a picture book. It was a middle grade novel with David Small, who's a Caldecott winner. And it was during COVID. 
and we were friends already. And, you know, we, so without the editor actually necessarily knowing we were emailing back and forth and he'd say, uh, here's what she looks like. What do you think? I'd be like, well, she looks a little like Pippi Longstocking with the two braids. He's like, okay, well, let's do one braid. And then he'd well, be this, like, this was, this, this was your circus book. Yeah. Long road to, long the, circus. Road to the circus. And, yeah. And then one point he said to me, I want to draw some chickens at the beginning of chapter four. Could you write in some chickens? And I'll be like writing in chickens. Okay. We've got chickens now. <laughs> because he wanted to draw some chickens and uh, so the chickens went in and you know, at one point he was like i don't think this chapter works and i'd be like no but here's why it does work and then he was like oh okay i see it so well then i'll draw it this way so we had a really nice kind of like relationship uh outside of our editor <laughs> but it worked and i think it made a better product in the end and i think he and here's key I think it made him more invested in the book because sometimes an illustrator's brought in and it's just a job you know, they, they're making the art, but they don't feel a personal connection to it necessarily. It's just something they need, you know, they need to put food on the table. This is a job. But if they so, feel but, but Betsy, isn't it, invested, isn't it your job? Yeah, isn't it your job as an author? I'm not talking about the, mm -hmm. the uh, editor for sure. Right. To write in a manner that invites the illustrator to become an, another owner of the book. Yes, but a lot of authors will write a hundred little tiny notes about what they think should be in well, the art. They'll be like, and I think that she should have like, she should be tripping at this moment and there should be a dog in the background. And it's like, no, 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 no. You've got you've to give enough notes so they know basically what's happening to make it make sense. But you've got to back off and let them have that ownership and bring their own voice to that book as well. It's a co-production. <laughs> Uh, this is particularly difficult when the author writes a wordless book. For I've sure. seen this happen because when they do that, I, I, I always well, wonder how do authors sell wordless wordless books that they aren't illustrators. That that must be a real sell. It must be. I have never listen. Do I do I have a book for you? Read it to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, what's on I the know. next page? Yep. Yep. It's like, it's like, and the they, but it works. I know a lot of authors who write wordless books and I'm like, well, well done there. Well done. Not, probably, nice not their, get it. probably not their debut book. Um, no, and I, but I have seen them get kind of mad that the illustrator is getting all the attention. I'm like, come on, come on. Okay. So uh, <laughs> keep going, keep going. We're on a roll here. Oh, okay. what are the important uh, things for, for a perfect book? Oh, other, other important things for the picture book. Let's see. Um, well, I've talked about the story. I've talked about the art. I've talked about how all the people working on it. And I, people always forget that poor art director. That art director is key uh, to the entire process. If the illustrator does not get along with the art director, that it's going to make a difference in the, in the long run. Um, but then let's see. There are also, well, and then it depends on... It, the editor really does make a huge difference because they can make huge changes. I had a book that was going to be about big, ugly giants dancing. It's called Giant Dance Party. And it lost its initial editor, got a new editor. New editor, wasn't as on, you know, hadn't been the one who acquired it, wasn't as much on board with it. And they were like, you know what? I think these giants need to be blue and fuzzy and cute. And I was like, really? Because I kind of thought the whole gist of this was disgusting, warty, human-looking giants dancing. That's that's a good hook. And they turned into blue, fuzzy, cutie little giants dancing. It was fine. It it was a pretty book. Uh, but I do miss, and I think the illustrator also missed, because it was kind of his idea, too. Uh, we missed our, our warty giants. They wanted to make it like a book you could give at birthdays and stuff. That's fine but I miss those, those warty giants. So the editor has a lot of power, particularly if it's an, er, like a first time author or illustrator. Um, and they can, they can completely swerve the book in another direction if they want to. So, so I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to shout out to my uh, editor in Israel, Yotam Schwimmer, who um, I, I think did with my, my recent book, a, what I think editors do best, which is to tell you what's missing. Yeah. I exactly. mean, anybody can tell you what there's too much of, usually mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. uh, but to say, you know, Mel, mm, there's a beat missing here. And, and, and yeah. to hear that, you know, as an, as an author, you, you've almost sold this book and, and, and there's a huge oy vey week until you find the beat. 
Right. Um, right. For me, for me, this is what really good editors are wonderful about. It's happened to me several times that an editor will say, um, something is missing. It, it doesn't really end here, does it? And mm -hmm. and then the author, you know, um shrivels up and goes home and, and has this terrible yes. anxiety yes. attack. Yes. Until either they work it out or not. Yes. It's true though. I, I just read a picture book the other day where I, it was a good book. The story was going well. I was really excited. And then it got to the ending. The ending was just there was no ending. It didn't Let's talk know about how to end. And, let's talk about beginnings and endings. Okay. So yeah. So beginning, if you can like hook the person like right from that page one, that's great. Now, sometimes the cover does that job, right? There's a there's a new book coming out by Ruthie, Lucy Ruth Cummings called uh, Dalmartian, which is about Martian Dalmatians. Uh, and that's good. It's right there. You know what you're getting. You're like, yes, these are alien dogs. Wow, great. Um, but the writing, the first page, you know, you got to kind of like hook the kids as well. You know, the story has got to like keep them going. I know a picture book is typically 32, 40, you know, 48 pages, but you still have to keep their attention at the start of it. Because as I often say with a story time of preschoolers, they're not going to be polite if they're bored. They're going to walk away. They kids don't have like, no, no, no. Let's see where this is going. Like, no, they don't. They don't have that patience. Or, so you or, have to I, have... Pay, or, or I pay to see the play. I'll stay. Exactly. Well, I might as well stay. I've got, you know, nothing else. For I, the next I, half I, hour. Pay, I, I pay twenty dollars for this book. I might right. as well read it. If I'm doing a story time and, the, and I'm reading a picture book and the kid is bored, the kid's going to stand up, walk behind me where the other books are and start pulling them off the shelf in bet, the middle bet, of my story time. The, 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 uh, you're, look, you're, you're also a librarian and you've probably read books to children a hundred thousand times. Oh, yeah. Has it ever happened to you that you're reading a really good book that you think it's good and the kids are bored? You, so I was a very shy person before I became a children's librarian. Yeah, Before you wrote me, that. I don't believe a word of yeah, it. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I was. I was. I was quiet. I and I tell you, this profession changes a person, because what I learned was I had to become big and loud and take your attention and make hand movements like this so that kids could pay attention. So yes, I have. I made a crucial mistake early in my children's literature career. I decided I was going to read a book that I loved when I was a kid. I used to read it with my mom, and it was Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss. Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss is the longest book ever written in the English language. Moby Dick's got nothing on Horton Hatches the Egg. I'm reading this. The kids are dying. They are just like, oh. And I am like, how long is this book? I learned a big lesson that day. Never, ever, ever read that book. And then I learned what length was good, what kind of books can like attract kids, attach them. I learned that there's two different kinds of picture books. There's the lap sit book that you read one on one with a child. And then there's the one that you do with a group, the group uh, picture book that you can do with a large group and you can read to them in some way. Those are two different picture books and do not get them confused because if you do, you will have bored, bored children on your hands. So, yeah. So that's the beginning, of course. And on the ending, you do need to stick the landing. I often think of, you know, when you you listen to a popular song and they didn't know how to end it, so they kind of like just fade out the music. Picture books can't do that. You either got to stick that landing or not. And if you know how to stick it, it it'll just make all the difference. People will love your book. And if you just sort of end, we notice. The kids will notice. And they'll be I, like, I, well, I, that was fine. I, I'm I'm a sucker for the wraparound endings, the endings that bring you back somehow to the beginning. That's great. I love it when they do that. Um, yeah, and you know, and I like books that sort of where the end papers are part of like that ending as well. It can kind of like, can just sort of like a like that little extra scene you get during the credits of a Marvel movie. You know, it's like a little extra bit. Sometimes even on the back of the book. Sometimes under the cover. You know, there's a oh, there's maybe a they, maybe of... they, maybe they should have like our outtakes. You know, pages that didn't get. Oh in. yeah. This is why spreads. I love seeing sketches from early uh, when people are making the early drafts and then you get to see the sketches, you get to see what got cut out. out. Oh, that's my, whenever I interview an author or an illustrator, I ask them, what didn't make the final cut? Or what did you have to cut that you were sad to see go? Because that's always the interesting thing. And usually it's a good thing it went. <laughs> but sometimes you're like, oh, I wish that was still in there. That, that was good. Yeah. 
I always like so let's, that. Let, let, let's talk about um, the uh, the moral of the story, the message. Oh, the... yes. So one of my, you know, I do the 31 days, 31 lists. One of those lists is message books. So message books can be done very badly, very easily. Any celebrity picture book, and there's like maybe three exceptions to this. Most celebrity picture books are message books because they don't know what else to do. Picture books began as message books. What was the first picture book? You know, A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. You know, that was their entire purpose. Their entire purpose was to give kids a moral, uh, you know, establishment the, the, and, and the, to teach the them early, morals. The earliest picture books are the book of Genesis. Yes, with, exactly. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, but when we're talking like actual picture, picture books, like uh, Little Goody Two Shoes was literally a book. It's pretty much what the title says, so, you know. So, I, because, I, because I agree with you, um, one of the things that drives me crazy in a good way is um, is Dodson, is uh, Lewis Carroll. Oh, and nonsense. how he was, yeah, how he was able to get away with in, in, in you know he was like a church person and mm. how did he get away with this nonsense what the jews called mishigas yeah in, you know what he did 100, he, 160 he, years ago he workshopped it with the girls remember he was telling them these stories and figuring out what was working what was not working with the kids themselves he's the original workshopping it with your intended audience author so no wonder the book actually worked because <laughs> for a time anyway and we can argue if that's still the case today, but for a time, kids really enjoyed that book because it was, well, and also he filled it with making fun of the rhymes they had to memorize in school and, and twisting course. them. And of course, you so basically, Father William, the young yeah, he was kid. the John Cheska of his age. You know, he was taking the thing that was familiar and then twisting it completely. Uh, so Betsy, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I was going to say I'm sitting with someone, but actually you're in America and I'm in Israel. Um, so I'm metaphorically sitting with someone who's just done the same thing in this book that's coming out in such a wonderful way. Good. I love that stuff. And kids love that stuff. So that's a that's a good way to go. But um, yeah, what were we saying? We were talking about uh, nonsense and not having a message at all. Oh, or... well, we were talking. Well, right. So messages versus not having messages. So, yeah. And you can do a good message book. I, that's why I collect them every year and say, look, if you're going to have a message, this is how you do it. You can do it. There's a book called The Rabbit Listened, which is the best picture book on how to deal with someone dealing with trauma. But it it's not like that. It's just a kid's blocks fell down. And then all these other animals are coming in, giving advice on how to deal with their sorrow. And it's like, you should laugh. You should get angry. You should, you know, take it out on someone else. And then and then the rabbit just comes in there and just listens to them talk about how upset they are. And it's like, it's so simple. But it's a very good message for adults too, and so that's how you write one. But it's tricky. I have I have a book that technically would be called a message book. I don't tend to do messages. This is why I won't win awards. But um, I I do have one message picture book that I do want to write. But it's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. I don't want to be preachy. I don't want to be didactic. I don't want to, you know, do any of that. And finding that balance. Good luck. It well, is hard. It, it, Nonsense is it, easy, quite frankly. No, I, I'm not sure it's easy. because Well, maybe not easy, to... but it takes a different set of muscles. How about that? Yes. yes. Because you, you, you have to um, give up all your uh, religion for Lent. Yes. <laughs> you have to be, you know, flat. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to sell you anything yeah. here except yeah. you know, garbage and you're going to love it. True, um, true. That's my that's my so, brand. But, oh. but but the rabbit listen is a story. I mean, um, it is. So so even if you want to have your message out there, you still have to have a good story. That right, exactly. Your storytelling still has to be intact. You can't just like, well, I don't know. Take any celebrity picture book and be like, you know, little Polly, you know knocked over her friend's ice cream and she didn't apologize and you're just looking at the kid who's snoring on the ground because they're just like this is so horrible <laughs> it's like yeah how important how, how important is humor humor well see you're asking the wrong person because i feel like humor is the most important thing but i would i would say that um i love humor but humor's hard because it's subjective 
as John Cheska, who I mentioned earlier, said to me once, I asked him, why do funny books not win big awards as much? And he's like, well, here's the deal. Here's a book in which a dog died. I'm sad. You're sad. He sat over there. We're all sad. We're sad that dog died. Here's a book with a joke in it. You laughed. You thought it was hilarious. I didn't think it was funny at all. He kind of thinks it's funny. Like humor is so, like we can read the same joke and have completely different reactions to it. Whereas if someone's dead, oh, that's sad. I'm all sad. You're sad. We all feel the same thing. So when people feel the same thing, it's very easy mm -hmm. for them to agree about a book. But when people feel very differently about whether the jokes land, uh, it's very difficult. This is not to say funny books can't win things. Look at Mexican, which just won five different ALA Youth Media Awards. And that book is hilarious. And it's got baby coffins and pop rocks with snot in it and all sorts of crazy stuff. Kid trying to saw off a deer's hoof, all sorts of weird stuff. But it works. Um, so, and I've, I've always tried to make the argument that like, oh, the Youth Media Awards, the Newberry and Caldecott never go to funny books. This is not true. Uh, even this year, uh, I, I think one of the Newberry honors, uh, is hilarious. Oh, two of them at least. So yeah, but, but yeah, so fun humor is great, but if you also bad humor can sink you, like I, like there are books with terrible, terrible humor, just the, la the jokes do don't, nobody laughs at all but this is where you need a good illustrator so often when the text is weak because celebrity uh they'll bring in an amazing illustrator and try to like make it look really good and that way aha see it's a great book but that only works some of the time mm. so uh humor is way up there if you get it right yes if you get it right uh, but because, but it's got to be they're... universal and that's hard yeah um, and the, so what else haven't we talked about? Um, repetition is a, is a double edged sword. Oh, I love, I, yeah, it is right. Rhyming and repetition. I would say they're, they're, they're tied very closely together. Repetition. You don't go as poorly with rhyming can kill you. If you've got a book that rhymes and it annoys people, cause that does happen. Uh, it's tricky because first of all, rhyming, I've tried to do rhyming picture books, they are hard. They are so difficult. You think you've got it. And then you come back like a week later and you read it and you're like, well, this mm -hmm. doesn't scan at all. Like the rhyme is, the meter is well, completely out there. It doesn't. I, I, I have a theory. Yeah. What's I'm your theory? share with you. Okay. It, it, rhyme is like, it's like having a little pebble in your, in your, uh, in your sandal or not. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I can read a beautiful story, but if there's like one little stanza where the meter is off. Yes. Or yeah. The rhyme. It yeah, that's the all it takes for me. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's like the, the, think about that it's pressure. Like, it's like yeah. the Melvin and the P. You know, there's this little P on page five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all it takes. It takes one poorly written rhyme, and suddenly I'm dismissing the entire book. I don't care how good it is. I'm like, mm -mm, no, I can't get over page five. That's just they didn't. They didn't. Nobody cared. Because but, you know but, how many people look at that book. You've got the editor, you've got the copy editor, you've got, you know, the publicity team looked at this initially. Like everybody was looking at this and nobody said anything. I find that weird. Okay, well, I, I'm going to make it even weirder. Because okay. like you've done 300 podcasts, I've done 150. Mm -hmm. um, and you, the world is full of people writing picture book manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Millions of people writing picture book manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, of Every several thousand manuscripts that get submitted to an agent, the agent will take one. Yeah. Out of thousands. Yeah. Okay. Then the agent goes and tries to sell it to an editor at a publishing house. And they look at a lot of different books and they choose one. And there's mm -hmm. thousands of illustrators. Yeah. And out of this choice of millions of combinations, I'm talking about traditionally published books, you mm -hmm. still get a lot of books that are okay. Yeah, it's true. Isn't what's it your, weird? It's weird. What's your theory? It's weird. It is weird. You wonder, well, I mean, I've seen what gets rejected and often I'm like, yes, well done. Well done. Okay. But yeah, sometimes really good stuff. I mean, you always hear the stories about like this book has just won an award and it was rejected by five editors at five different houses and things like that, which is probably true. 
Um, because I've had books, you don't know why. They have a range of reasons why they're rejecting a book. The editor, the agent, all that. I and once that, had a book rejected because it was about grandmas. Question. Yeah. Yeah. But there's you're right. You're talking books. about, but you're talking about when the bad there's books, a lot of, basically. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah, wonderful some books some about real grandma. schlock makes it to publication, and I'm I. No, you, you, I have, you said that. You said that. I said it. Yeah, yeah, I'll stand by it. There's a lot of schlock, and so, and I read I read a lot of schlock. I like every day on my lunch break. I read five picture books that are coming out. But these these are books that have been that have been out of thousands and thousands. Yes, out of thousands. These were the best of the best, and even then. Out of everything I'm sent, I only read a smaller portion. I can sort of eyeball. Yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, no. I keep the no's just in case. Doesn't really come up. And then I read the yeses. And I miss stuff. There was at least one Caldecott honor this year that I never even read. And I was like, okay, missed that one. <laughs> right? Good to know. But I try to read as much as I can. And even out of the best of the stuff that I see from what I am sent, so much, most of it is like, nope, nope. Or you know what it is? It's not even that they're bad. Perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Innocuous. Okay. Good. Nice. That's our worst word. That's the word we kill books with. Oh, that book? It's very nice. It's a nice book. Real nice. The, prem the premise. The premise. The whole thing. Just nice. And th that that means I will never look at that book again. Yeah. And But I do find once in a while a really good book in there. So it's like sifting through all the sands to find that gold. So, and, so, yeah, uh, so but yeah, how, it's amazing. How, how, how does that affect you as an author? I never take it personally because I because my rejections often are weird. Like I got I had a book once uh that I'm still trying to sell. I have an editor who is interested, but of course then they're going to another house and who knows if they'll land and all that fun stuff. But it was about books. And I was told by one publisher, ah. Picture books about books don't sell. I was like, it's these it's these wisdoms that they have to live by. Uh, because for a long time, they're like, oh, books with green covers, they never sell. It's like, really? Um, so they'll, you know, I had one where it's about grandmas. And they were like, well, we already have a book about a grandma coming out next season. So that's, an, that's another reason. That's yeah, another it is. Reason. That's another reason. They already have a book an, that's an vaguely agent, the same topic. With a grandma. We'll yeah, we can't do it. Grandma. We already did a grandma book. Now, this used to happen a lot with, um, particularly with picture book biographies, where mm -hmm. they'd be like, oh, we there already is a book on Peg Leg Bates. You can't write another one. Meanwhile, there, there were 500, you know, Abraham Lincoln books coming out constantly. But it's like, no, it, the, it, it, that is better these days. Now you can get multiple books on the same person, um, you know, and it's good. But but it, it's gotten better, but it, even so, and you know, actually picture book biographies have improved vastly in the last five years. So two thumbs up on that one for nonfiction. We haven't even talked about nonfiction, which gets no love. I mean, I don't think a single nonfiction book won a Newbery or a Caldecott this year. And that's insane because we had some primo amazing books this year. So uh, do, do you, do you agree with the, uh, with Melissa Stewart that, that nonfiction gets a bad rap? Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I think just look at the awards this year. Um, you can see like uh, the man who stole Mona Lisa should have gotten mm -hmm. a Newbery honor. Nothing. I mean, he got a cyber, sure, but uh, Jumper about the spider by Jessica Lanan. That is one of the most beautifully illustrated picture books of the year. It's got a gatefold that goes around, and you can like see how a spider sees from a three hundred and sixty degree angle. That book's insane. You take off the cover. And there's just a spider there. Um, people find spiders creepy. And so they it probably didn't win for that reason. Also, it's nonfiction. Nonfiction gets no and poetry. Uh, My Head Has a Bellyache, one of the funniest, best written books of the year. Did it get anything? Nothing. Nothing. We don't have a poetry award, weirdly. Very weirdly. But mm. so uh, we have lots more to talk about. But what I want to know is how does this impact you? I mean, you um you write picture books. Sure. I write a lot of picture uh, books. Yeah. So when you're yeah. sitting down to write, um, how how does this like you 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 have so much knowledge, and mm -hmm. you know you you read more picture books than practically anybody I know. Um, how does this how does this affect your writing? Like you sit and say, oh no, I'm, no grandma no spider no uh, Hanukkah no um, you know. 
Yeah, or it has to. Are you, be... are, are you empowered by all this knowledge or stifled yeah. by all this knowledge? I could be stifled if I thought about it. Thankfully, I my brain doesn't work that way. So I'm fine. Usually what happens is I'll get an idea for a picture book, say the weasel book, where I'm reading yeah. nursery rhymes to my kids. And just for fun, I'll be like, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown. And when goes the weasel? And they think it's hilarious. And I'm like, that would be a good picture book. I file it away. Or I write it down, hopefully, and I get little notes saying, say, this would be a good idea for a picture book. Then later, I might go back to that and be like, oh, that was a good idea. And then but I'll, I'll put it away. The best example of this is I work in a library where two peregrine falcons roost and have babies on it every year. We have a little camera. We band them with a field museum. We have a whole ceremony. And for years, years, I've been here nine years, nine years, people have been like, you should write a picture book about them. And I was like, What's it going to say? Once upon a time, there were two birds named Squawker and uh, and Faye, and they had lots of babies and they were very successful at the end. That's not a story. But then we got some stupid birds, real dumb birds to replace them who did everything wrong. I'm like, that's your story. And now terrible I have a picture book on that. Birds. Terrible, terrible birds. See now, and I have a good, I, the thought of the title right away. And so that, That's but the, it I, took nine years for that book, for that idea to even like coalesce. Because if it's not there, it's not there. You don't want to, it was a great idea at the beginning to do a book about them, but that's not enough. You need to bring all these elements together. Dear Betsy, I'm mm -hmm. 72 years old. Mm -hmm. For 71 years, I did not have a traditionally published picture book. It takes time. It does. And I tell that to kids. So kids will be like, what is, you know, they, they have to ask this. This is their standard question. What is your advice for young authors? And my advice is always, you don't have to do it now. <laughs> you can wait. You can literally wait 20, 30, 40 years. It doesn't matter. The great thing about picture books is they don't care how old you are. It really doesn't matter. There's no ageism. I mean, there might be some slight ageism, but not really. Because nobody's looking at you when they're looking at your manuscript. They're just looking at the manuscript. And they are, you know, rejecting or taking it based entirely on that. So you can do it any time. You, I put out a picture book maybe once every two or three years, but I'm not in a rush. Um, you that's know, I'm one. not making a living off of it. See, that's the key. If I was trying to make well, a living off of this, very different. For 99.99999% of us, yeah, it's a living for other people that we provide. Right, we, right. We pay other people. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's I, why I, I will not quit I my just, day job. Yeah. I just got, I just got my, um, my what's it called? The royalties for the uh, mm -hmm. first half year. Yeah. Um, I could go to the movies. Yeah. Could you get yourself um, a Starbucks coffee? <laughs> yeah. A few actually, but but not nice. the not the big one. Not the not the venti. It'd be more of a grande. No. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I don't. I, I'm more of a I, grande guy. I consider residual like money that I get in from my books. I thought you were money from say the residual coffee. The residual coffee. I yeah. consider like uh yeah money from my books that I get in the you know I get a, I get some money and it's like yeah. I call it money from the sky. Like look, money from the sky fell. I don't expect it. So when it comes, it's a delightful surprise. It's like oh look, a check. How nice, how novel, but I'm not going to live off of it. Yeah. But okay, other people so do. I, and other people have to like, yeah. oof, that's a yeah. whole process. So, so, so our best news for aspiring authors is keep at it. Yeah. Um, enjoy don't the expect process. to quit your day job. <laughs> have a day job. Have never a day leave, job. Never leave your day job. If you, I mean, let's say that you sell, have a huge three book deal, right? And you sell it really well. You can, Become a full-time author, but that means you're going to be visiting schools all the time. That's where your primary income is going to be coming in, school visits. And that's I a, hope you're a performer, and I hope you like to perform, because that's, that's where the money's coming from. That's oy vey, because some, we live across from, from a school, and sometimes we have to escape from the house. Yeah. Um, so, Betsy, uh, the, the, this we wanted to talk more, but it's already 50 minutes, mm -hmm. and you have your own blogs and podcasts and stuff mm -hmm. to do. And I'm just enthralled that you were on the program. Um, and um, it's been wonderful. It's so wonderful. Well, thanks for I'm having me. To, ah, you're kidding. You're famous. And, and I knew we would have Aww. a good time. And I'm going to pester you. I might have you back. I'll, I'll just look for excuses, you know. 
Mm -hmm. um, oh, great. People, people whose whose um, whose last names are, were descended from dinosaurs. Oh, birds! Betsy Bird. Oh, I'll <laughs> bring her back on this. Side. Very good. At, at any rate, we will have you back towards the end of the year, unless you didn't have a good time. Um, and I'm going to ask time. you, and I'm going to ask you, as I ask everybody, to leave the meeting and then come back to the same link so we can have a little five minute uh, tete tete. And That's um, good. And there's so many things we didn't talk about. Uh, we mm -hmm. didn't talk about theatricality, but I guess it was obvious in what we were talking about. We can talk yeah, about it next time. It's all worked in. Yeah. All right. Betsy well, Bird, thanks for having me. Wonderful author, Thank blogger, you. podcaster, wonderful person. We didn't talk about your life and uh, growing up in Kalamazoo. We'll That's do fine. that. No, but I mean, we'll do it next time. We have to leave oh, something. That'll be fun. We'll leave it for. Thanks. Yeah. And how Betsy Bird left her nest. There you go. <laughs> nice. Sorry, another oy vey. Writes itself. Oh. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, terrible. <laughs> this is, and I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I am the, uh, what am I? I'm the chair, what, what am I? Not the chairman. I'm, you got me all confabulated I know. now. It's my way. Uh, I'm the host. That's what I am. I'm the host That's of good. the children's, it's not bad. <laughs> That's a ticket. You got it. Yeah. I'm the host yeah. of the Children's Literature Channel and the New Books Network, and I've been here with the wonderful, incredible, Betsy Bird, we've been flying together for 52 minutes. Uh, my heart has wings. Go out and come back. And for everybody else, run out and buy Betsy Bird's books that are on the shelf. Uh, I'm warning you, The Long Road to the Circus has almost 260 pages. It's a big old book. But it's wonderful. It won all kinds of awards. Go get it. And if you are a Santa believer, then, um, yeah, buy the book. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. Bye-bye, everybody. Come back. Bye.